off talking about patterns. We give the introduction to patterns. And I kind of talked about what patterns were in general. I talked about some examples relating to other domains that use patterns, like music and sports and uh, building architecture and civil transportation with the New Jersey jug handles and J-turns and so on. And we looked at a couple of examples. We looked at the observer pattern, which is a very core pattern that's used quite widely in user interface environments to be able to decouple the subject or the state from the way to visualize or, or observe the state. We talked about that. And we were just about ready to talk about some of the different ways that you describe patterns. You characterize what it is that they do. Uh, it's always important to remember when you talk about patterns that the, the way we describe the thing is always somewhat different than the thing itself. And so that's our attempt at trying to, to get a grasp on, on the real thing by describing stuff. And to make it a little easier to try to see what the, the thing is from the description of the thing, we follow a, a stylized format to describe patterns. And what I'm going to show you here is sort of a distillation of the forms that you'll see in some of the classic literature on patterns. So one thing that you need, of course, is a name. And you'll see that all the gang of four pattern names are all very short and to the point. And they're usually things that take very little uh, time to remember and visualize. So adapter, right? You think of maybe the, the adapter plug we were talking about. Um, observer, you think about you know, various classes watching something as it changes its state. Iterator, you think about being able to access every element in an aggregate or a, a container without exposing its implementation. So real crisp, short, to the point. You, know, you don't want long, long pattern names like uh, the cow jumped over the moon on Thursday or something because it's not going to be something you're going to remember. It won't be very memorable. You, you know, if, you're, if you want to be a famous celebrity, the, what, what's the ultimate in being a famous celebrity? One word name, right? Your Cher, your Bono, your Madonna, right? You know, poor, think about poor someone like uh, Prince Charles. If you ever listen to Prince Charles' oris original wedding to Lady Dian Diana, he has like 35 names, you know? So he's, he clearly will never be as great a celebrity as Bono or Madonna. His name's too long. Another thing you need in a, uh, a pattern description is, is the reason or the goal why you're trying to use the pattern in the first place, an intent. Right? So in the case of something like a, uh, an adapter pattern, the intent is to be able to allow elements or classes or functions or objects to work together that weren't designed to work together. Or in the in case of the observer pattern, it's to be able to define a one-to-many mapping where a change in one object can generate a notification to an untold number of other objects. Right? These are real succinct. They kind of capture in, a, in one sentence, maybe two at the most, what the, the pattern does and why you might want to use it, which is very important. A pattern description also needs to explain what problems you're trying to solve. Uh, in other words, are you trying to make software more easy to reuse? Are you trying to make software that's going to be easier to extend? Are you trying to make software that's going to be easier to debug? You know, what's, what's the problem that's being addressed? And you can describe these in various levels of detail, sometimes more specific, sometimes less specific. Ideally, People love to learn in the context in which they're trying to apply the solution. Right? So if you're trying to build something that's going to be focused on user interfaces, you'd like all the explanations to be in the form of user interfaces. Even more importantly, if you're trying to build a user interface for Android, you'd like all the descriptions to be in the context of user interface issues for Android and so on. You, you, people like very narrowly focused examples because it relates close to their life. Um, like I'll give you an example, you, you try to talk to little kids, you, you start talking about really abstract concepts and they get lost instantly because they don't have enough perspective to see the bigger picture. So what do you do? You tell them a story about animals or themselves or things they can relate to and then you, you slowly generalize to something that's more abstract. So is it with patterns? You want a pattern description that describes a problem that is relevant but is also not such a point solution that people will get lost in the myriad details of that solution. So there's always kind of this compromise. And it's, it's usually not ideal for anybody, right? Nobody uh, necessarily wants to do exactly what the pattern description is telling you to do, but you're giving them a hint. You're giving them a heuristic, a set of heuristics to learn about those things. And of course, in real life, what you do, if you start working for a company, people will take these more generic patterns and they will customize them for whatever they actually do. And if you take a look at Android, if you take my CS282 class next semester uh, in the fall, we'll learn lots and lots about these patterns 
applied in Android, and all the discussions will be much more narrowly focused on Android, but the patterns generalize. So what you will have learned in the context of what we do here will apply in those other contexts. And hopefully, as I mo motivated to you last time we talked about this, that ability to go between the abstract and the concrete and back again is incredibly valuable. I'll give you two reasons, one of which we talked about before. One reason it's incredibly valuable is because it allows you to retool yourself to new tools, new platforms, new languages, new methods, and so on, without having to throw everything you've learned out the window and start from scratch. And that's, that's called job security, or that's called ease of retraining. Um, another thing, if anybody here ever wants to go into intellectual property uh, law, it turns out that the skills that are required to understand patterns of software are also incredibly useful to understand patents of software. And so if you're ever called an expert, expert witness where you have to understand how a specification in a patent and the claims in that specification map to a particular piece of code in question, which either infringes or allegedly infringes or does not infringe and is prior art and so on, um, then you need to be able to go from the abstract claims to a concrete example and back again. And, and exactly the same reasoning ability works in both cases. So there's lots of different reasons to think about things in this more abstracted way. There's also, of course, the solution. That's what we tend to think about. What's the solution? And those solutions are typically described both visually in the form of some kind of diagram, a UML diagram or something that's a bit more informal, um, or and or something in text that lists the various participants, says a little bit about what they do, and so on, trying to describe the structure of the, of the pattern. And you also want to be able to do not just the structure, but also the dynamics. How do things interact? How do they talk to each other? What's the, what's the way in which they met, call methods on each other? How do they do their interactions? Is it through callbacks? Is it through direct calls? And so on and so forth. That's very important because structure alone, as you'll see, is not sufficient to disambiguate various patterns, many of whom have a very similar looking structure. Another thing that you often find in patterns, not, no, so first of all, these, these things we saw here are the, the key ones. You'll find these in pretty much every pattern description. Then as you start talking about patterns that are more software focused, you start getting into more things that programmers care about. So they typically care about implementation. They want to know how do I do it? They don't want to just know what's the problem to be solved and sort of a high level sketch of the solution. They want actual code because that's ultimately what has to be working. That's what you get paid for when it, you ship. You don't ship UML documents, you ship working code. So oftentimes good pattern descriptions have some code guidance. They'll tell you here are the steps that you might want to follow when implementing this pattern. Here's some examples in your favorite language, C++ or Java or C or Objective-C or Smalltalk or whatnot. And uh, that just helps people kind of orient themselves to what's real. Now, the code is not always super duper detailed that may leave a lot of the details out. I'm filming some stuff, working on some stuff for my MOOC that's going to start here shortly. And uh, you know, half the trick is to figure out what's important to emphasize and what you should leave behind. So I'm going through all the Android examples and I'm finding examples of all these concurrency mechanisms, concurrency models, concurrency patterns in Android. And then I'm showing the students by walking through them in the videos how they work. But I'm not going to spend three or four hours looking at every line of code because it doesn't really matter for the things we're talking about. So I have to abstract out just the stuff that illustrates the key points, the patterns, the key mechanisms, the synchronization um, strategies, and so on. There's also consequences of applying patterns. It's sometimes tempting when you first learn about a pattern to, to get excited and want to use it for everything. And very quickly, you begin to realize that there's some things that certain patterns are good for, some things that certain patterns aren't so good for. And it's the, the wise developer that chooses intelligently amongst the alternatives. In fact, in many ways, that's really what separates the novice from the expert. The expert will have had a lot of experience building software, and they'll be able to tell, much like uh, Eskimos have you know, 37 different names for snow, because there's different kinds of snow, and to them it matters. To us, down here in Tennessee, it's just an annoyance, right? We don't really stop to think a whole lot about it. You know, there's like snow, and, and that means you have a hassle getting out of your dorm or getting to work or whatnot. So an expert will have a much deeper, richer understanding of the different variants and alternatives than the beginner will, but a pattern that should be written by an expert, of course, needs to clearly document the pros and cons of applying it, because you're not going to use it to solve all the different problems under the sun. And any pattern that is so general to solve every problem is probably hard-pressed to solve any problem, because you can't figure out how to apply it in practice. 
Another important thing, patterns need to follow what's called the rule of three. Something isn't really a pattern until you see multiple uses of it somewhere in the wild, not just in your lab, not just in your code. You have to be able to point and say, look, Android does it this way. Look, Unix does it this way. Look, Windows does it this way. Ah, it's a pattern. And there are lots and lots of patterns that fit that characterization. But showing it real examples from real working software is important. This, of course, is where open source really pays off. Back in the, the battle days, hardly anybody had any access to the source code. Nowadays, with all this open source, Linux is open source, uh, Android's open source, Ace and Dow are open source, Apache is open source, it goes on and on and on. You can pretty much find examples of what you want somewhere, and when you read the code, you'll be like, wow, there it is, boom, right there. As I've been going through the Android code, it's really fascinating to me that the people who wrote that code were incredibly well-versed in patterns, for the most part. And you'll see common themes again and again and again. And now that I, I know the patterns, I'm like, oh, look, you know, every synchronization mechanism in, in, in Java slash Android, they're all using the bridge pattern. And then, and then you go, why is that? Ah, they want to keep a common interface, but be able to select different implementations of semaphores or condition variables or reentrant locks or whatnot with different semantics within the same interface. So they use the bridge pattern, which we'll talk about later. So it's kind of cool to see these things. As you learn about them, you'll start seeing them lots of places. So examples, known uses are important. And then, of course, no pattern is an island. Patterns don't exist in isolation. They work together. So when you learn about one pattern, oftentimes you also get a chance to learn about others if for no other reason to find out which one not to use when you're choosing that one. Yes, Danny. What is the rule of three here? So the rule of three says you should see at least three independent known uses of something before you can call it a pattern. Before that, it's just a design. There's nothing wrong with a design, by the way. It's just it's a proto-pattern or it's a candidate pattern. It's your idiosyncratic way of doing something that seems to solve a problem. But it doesn't become uh, anointed to the pattern uh, you know, fraternity or sorority until you get multiple known uses of it, which gives you more confidence. It's not just a random occurrence. Yes, Tristan. So the design patterns by the beginning of four seems to be the, you know, the canonical uh, out outline of these. They're a, they're a canonical outline of things, but yes. Yeah, okay, keep going. Right, okay. Um, well, I, I was just wondering so how comprehensive is this? So, so, so when, you were, when you were looking through the, the Android code, for example, was, um, could, could you uh, attribute most of the, the patterns you saw in there to the pattern is described in, in the beginning or, or related. Yeah, yeah. great, great question. Sure. So the question is, uh, two, it's really a multi-part question. The question is, how fundamental are the gang of four patterns? And are there patterns that exist beyond the gang of four patterns that you'll see in common use? So the gang of four patterns are very common, but they absolutely by no means close the book on patterns. In fact, there probably are several orders of magnitude more patterns that are in common use than the gang of four do. If for no other reason that the gang of four really focus on object-oriented design and programming for non-distributed, non-concurrent, non-fault-tolerant, non-secure systems, <laughs> right? So you, that, which you've just carved out, you know, a, a, a very important substrate, but the world is much bigger than that. Um, to use my never-ending uh, Lord of the Rings references, you can think of the Gang of Four patterns as like Hobbiton, okay? Not even all the Shire, okay? It's a piece of the Shire, but there's a lot more to the world, to the cosmology, than just the Gang of Four patterns. Having said that, th they're a great starting point, right? So when you're, when you're learning, you know, you probably don't remember back this far, but when you're learning, you know, uh, math, right? You don't start out with differential equations. What do you do? You learn to add, and you spend a lot of time adding, and then you learn to subtract, and you spend a lot of time that, and you learn to multiply. So the Gang of Four patterns are kind of like addition, subtraction, multiplication. They're basic skills everybody needs, but they don't in and of themselves allow you to solve every possible problem, which is perfectly acceptable. Um, the interesting thing is, as you look at the Android code or other code, um, you'll see a lot of those fundamental patterns because they are very fundamental. But the minute you start looking at the concurrency, distribution, fault tolerance, persistence, security, there's new things you've got to deal with that the Gang of Four, for whatever reason, mostly because they had to write the book within a deadline and they couldn't spend the rest of their lives trying to get the whole thing uh, compiled. They covered the things they knew best and they left out other stuff for others to come along with. So since the Gang of Four book has been devised, lots and lots and lots and lots more literature so you can learn more from other sources. Yes, Patrick? But it seemed like patterns weren't really developed, they're just recognized and... That's exactly right. Patterns are not um, invented, they're discovered, right? So in, in that way, I guess they're sort of like precious gems, you know? <laughs> Unless you're uh, Superman or something, you can crush carbonite into diamonds with your fist. Uh, you know, you don't go out in the, in the morning to create 
diamonds, you go out to discover them, right? You're, you're a miner, you're searching for them. Same thing is true with patterns. Uh, the difference is, maybe this is the difference, maybe it's not. Um, over time, as a body of software expertise evolves, new patterns, in fact, will emerge. Um, whereas it's not as likely that new gems will emerge. I guess we could come up with new ways to make you know, things that are like gems, right? But, um, so, that, so in some sense, it's an ever-growing pool of things because people's requirements keep evolving and changing. And what counts as best practice in one generation of stuff may not be sufficient to count as best practice in the next generation of things. So clearly, before the advent of these wonderful mobile devices, um, a lot of things we now take for granted, like location-aware blah, blah, right? Everybody's doing location-aware stuff these days. Well, back you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, when we weren't doing mobile applications on phones uh, the way we do now, location-aware stuff really didn't matter. Likewise, before maybe 10 years ago, there weren't an army of um, orcs trying to break into your computing system 24-7, every corner of the world, right? So a lot of the security things that we now take as best practices didn't really even exist. So patterns keep evolving, they keep changing. I have to tell you my, my story. This is a good time to tell it because it makes the point nicely. So when I, was, uh, when I was in high school, actually junior high school and high school, I played soccer, which, in, which nowadays everybody, that's not interesting, everybody plays soccer, right? But when I was going to school back in the dark ages, um, soccer was very unusual. Most people in the U.S. didn't play soccer. Most people in the U.S. played football or baseball, basketball, but they didn't play soccer. In fact, when I, where I went to school, because we had a lot of people from other countries who were on the soccer team because they played soccer there, everybody said soccer is a communist sport. <laughs> I'm actually not quite sure what that meant because mo most people were from, you know, like, I don't know, well, yeah, they're from South America, India, uh, other places in the, in the world. Maybe some of them were communists, maybe they weren't. But the point was, it was weird. It was unusual. Um, and so the... In fact, my, my other claim to fame, my other brush with celebrity was I actually played on the soccer team at William & Mary with Jon Stewart. So I knew Jon Stewart back when he was John Leibowitz. And uh, I was just looking through my yearbook the other day from William & Mary. I should, I should scan this picture and send it out. There's a bunch of pictures of him playing soccer. Um, he was not as famous then as he was now. In fact, most people couldn't stand him because he was drunk all the time and very obnoxious. But that's another story. <laughs> But you see, he, he's turned that into a career, and <laughs> his liberal arts background has enabled him to be very successful, and I'm quite proud of him. Um, so, so basically, in those days, if you were in a sports team with people from all around the world, and you're a guy, you know, what do you think you learn from your fellow teammates? Curse you learn curse words. You learn to swear in other people's languages, exactly. <laughs> So I could swear, by the end of my you know, junior year, I could swear in you know, Farsi and Swahili and Hindi and Spanish and you know, a whole bunch of different languages. Now, is that because those languages are only sufficient to swear in? Well, in the case of German, perhaps, right? <laughs> Speaking as a German. But you know, the reason that we were unable to articulate much in these languages is because our vocabulary was extremely limited, right? Um, same thing is true with patterns. There's lots of patterns out there. If you only know the Gang of Four book, or worse, you only know, you know three or four of the patterns in the Gang of Four book, you will be no better off than we were in high school in our soccer team where we could only swear in other languages because our limited vocabulary was what was holding us back. So, of course, if we really wanted to get you know, more sophisticated and go other places in the world and engage in people in broader form of communication, we'd have to learn those languages and those forms of expression. So is it with patterns. As you get better at your software art, you will learn a broader vocabulary, and then you'll be able to communicate with other learned software developers much more fluently. Yes? Would certain curses, like you, know, you unsavory body part, qualify as patterns if they emerge? I think it is fair to say that all languages contain swearing. How about that? So that's probably a pattern. Um, <laughs> It would be interesting to find anthropologically if there are any cultures that were so, like maybe the elves don't swear, you know? That's about the only thing I can think of that wouldn't swear. Certainly the dwarves would swear a lot, and the orcs would too, but maybe not hobbits and elves. Okay, so there's lots of more information here on various pattern forms that you might take a look at. So to summarize this, patterns codify software expertise and support design in a more abstract way than code. So this is both a blessing and a curse, right? Uh, it's a blessing because it allows you to think about design 
qua design, just a fancy way of saying thinking about design in its own terms. We can talk about the observer pattern unfettered, unconstrained by C++ quirks, or Java quirks, or C quirks, or Objective-C quirks, or Scalus quirks, or whatnot. We can think about the design in, the, in an isolated or independent way from the implementation of said design. And that's really helpful, because now as you move between different paradigms, as you go from, go from Android to, to uh, iOS, or you go to Windows, or you go to BlackBerry, or you go to Unix, or other platforms, they all have the observer pattern there one way or another. They just realize it in different languages and different forms. So that gives you a, a running start. When you go to move to someplace new, if you understand things in this way, you will take those patterns with you. And then it's just a matter of saying, oh, how do they do it in this language or this framework, not what the heck is going on here in the first place? So that's the value of a broader education, which in some sense, by the way, is the value proposition for a liberal arts degree, because you get this broad experience, even though you may not be highly hyper-specialized in one thing, you've hopefully gathered the ability to learn a broader range of things and retool yourself over time. We sometimes think about patterns as being equated with object-oriented languages, but they can apply to non-object-oriented languages as, as well. In fact, it's probably important to remember, because maybe in your careers at some point, you'll run across some um, anachronisms, right? There, there are always people who kind of come from other communities of technology, and they get sort of left behind, and they love their little, little world. Kind of like in Australia, there's marsupials that exist only because Australia was cut off from the mainland and the predators couldn't come over and eat them, right? Like koala bears and, and other things. There, there are oftentimes situations like that in, in everyday life where you find people who are sort of throwbacks to older generations of stuff. And they will argue, these patterns are only good for this newfangled object-oriented stuff that's been around since 1980. It's newfangled, you know? We don't trust these things. It's new math, newfangled. And the thing to remind them, and usually they, they happen to program in C, by the way, just to give you a little hint. And it turns out that a good C programmer actually has to have more understanding of patterns than a good Java or C++ programmer because the language lacks fundamental abstractions to save them from the dragons of accidental complexity that would otherwise plague them and destroy them. So good programmers in those languages actually embrace patterns because that's the way they deal with complexity. Whereas in other languages, they're built in. They're baked into the language. So never let people tell you that these things are only good for one language or one thing. Patterns are also helpful because they help you to work at a more cohesive level of abstraction. Uh, sometimes we give an analogy of playing chess. If you're an expert chess player and you look at a board that's a properly laid out board, a good chess player or an expert chess player can see patterns of relationships between pieces, whereas a novice would only see individual pieces. They've done some studies on that and found that to be true. They've also done some studies that said, if you take a chessboard and you just randomly arrange the pieces in a way that wouldn't normally occur in practice, uh, an expert's really no better than a novice because the patterns don't, they don't match what they're looking for, right? Kind of interesting. So one of the great things about patterns is they help chunk things at a little bit higher level. So you can think in terms of those higher level units. So rather than having to remember all the implementation details that go into doing a particular incantation or incarnation of observer, once you know the observer pattern, you now have a higher level unit of abstraction to interact with your fellow colleagues and yourself, six months later, once you forgot what you did uh, with the code you wrote, you have a more effective way to interact and, and involve each other. Now, just to make that point, if, if you were to go to your design team, let's say you're working on a project course, you've got an internship, or you have a summer job, or you work with some colleagues, and you want to tell them about some design you did before, and you're like, uh, okay, everybody, remember? We had this implementation one time where we had an array of pointers to functions, and we, we walked through that array with a loop that started at zero, well, less than n, or was it less than or equal to n? Did it start at one? Was it an array? Was it a linked list? No, I think it was pointers to basically, you know, you start getting wrapped up in all these details that really don't matter. If instead you can say, hey, remember everybody when we did the observer pattern last year? Oh yeah, I remember observer. We had these callbacks, blah, blah, blah. Saves a lot of time, especially once people get a chance to understand those abstractions. And even if they don't understand the abstractions, if somebody is new to the team or they forgot or they never had the benefit that you guys do to take a course like this, you go, oh, go read this uh, web link or go read this chapter in the Gang of Four book or go watch this video or take a MOOC or whatever. And then they'll be able to understand these things without having to go through some long and painful apprenticeship process trying to learn it some other way.
Another thing that patterns do is they provide good targets for design and implementation refactoring. So this is something that's very important. You don't get a lot of exposure to it when you're an undergrad, typically. We're trying to teach you to write code, not take a lot of other people's code and refactor it. But in the real world of software development, a lot of time is spent taking existing code and redoing it so that it does something a little different. Maybe it runs on a different platform. Maybe it adds a new feature. Maybe it is going to integrate with other languages or other tools or something like that. So refactoring, or maybe you, you've decided over time that there's just way too much effort being expended trying to maintain this cursed pile of code and you want to rearrange part of it to make it easier to understand and modify. Patterns are extremely helpful in that endeavor. They help you figure out how to separate interface from implementation. They figure out how to hide implementation details. They make it possible to plug things in, strategize, proxy, adapt, and so on. It's also important to note that patterns by themselves are a great starting point to learn, but in real life, very few, if any, patterns are islands. They don't exist by themselves. We don't see the observer pattern off by itself, disconnected from all the other patterns. In real life, observers combine with many other things, like iterator, or proxy, or bridge, or something else. And so understanding those relationships is the next set of things. Now, we're going to get just a little bit of along those ways in this class. We're not going to get too far down the road. And that's because we have to learn how to understand the basic building blocks first. Well, once again, going back to how you learned English or how you might have learned another language if you chose to learn another language after your, your mother tongue, your native tongue, uh, you don't start off by reading sophisticated philosophical treaties. right? You don't take, uh, you know, when you're learning German, you don't start by reading the work of Kant on the metaphysics, metaphysics of the uh, you know, foundations of morals or something like that. You would get nowhere, right? Because you wouldn't even understand what the words meant. You start out with vocabulary. You, you memorize this stuff. You do sight words. You learn conjugation of verbs, regular and irregular verbs. Same thing is true with patterns. So we have to spend some time on the basics just so you know what the, the building blocks are. Patterns are often related together. Here's a simple example. You, know, you might have an observer that is going to adapt existing subject data and make it so you can plug things in, so you can have different ways of looking at stuff with a strategy. And then you might define some kind of proxy so you can access this observer across a concurrency or network boundary. So a group of patterns that would work together. There's a bunch of different names for these things. We're going to just talk about them briefly and then not go over too much more of them. There's things called pattern complements, which are places where patterns complement each other. Uh, for example, there's a pattern you'll learn about called the factory method. We're going to use a lot of it. Your current assignment, in fact, has it. You have to create something. It's a factory that makes something for you. Um, the Gang of Four book has lots of stuff about factories, prototypes, builder, factory method, abstract factory, singleton, and so on. Oddly, the Gang of Four book says almost nothing about disposing. It doesn't say about what you do once you've made something. Now, if you're, you're a Java programmer, that can be kind of OK, because a lot of times in Java, you can make stuff, and the garbage collector will clean it up for you when you're done. But in other languages like C or C++, you've got to find some way to clean it up. So there's another pattern that came along later called disposal method that talks about how to get rid of stuff that was created by a factory method. So that's an example of pattern complements. They complement each other. There's also things called pattern compounds. Pattern compounds are used to connect several, typically two, patterns together to make a more complex concept. So we talked about iterator before. STL has iterators galore. Iterators are patterns or realizations of patterns that let you march through every element in a container or aggregate without revealing the structure of the aggregate or container. And then we've also, haven't talked about it, but there's also this concept of a batch method. Rather than making one invocation at a time and passing one set of parameters, a batch method allows you to be able to pass a group of methods in one operation. And then those operations all get run in some other context typically in a context that takes a while to get to. So you could use a batch method if you're going to send some stuff that's going to go across a distribution boundary, or a context switch boundary, or a concurrency boundary. So you have batch method, you have iterator. So not surprisingly, one thing that people do is they create batch iterators, where they combine batch methods with iterators to be able to have a group of things that get passed over, and then you iterate through them locally. And when you're done, you ask for the next group or chunk, and it gives you the next batch of those things to work on. Anybody here who's ever done any studying about the way that buffered I.O. works on operating systems like Unix or Windows and so on, there's a concept called buffered I.O. 
And it's this very idea of reading a chunk of data from a disk or a network, moving it into a local buffer in the address space of the application, and then iterating through it one character at a time in order to be able to get access to the characters very efficiently. If you tried to access each character from the disk one at a time, it would take an eternity because there's a lot of overhead to go back and forth between user mode and kernel mode, as you'll discover when you take an operating systems course. So you instead use a batch iterator and you bring a group of things in and batch them and then work on them one at a time locally, which makes the efficiency go up. There's also something called pattern sequences, um, where you combine many patterns together. We're not going to have sufficient time at the moment to talk about pattern sequences, but when you start getting a little further along in some of the stuff we'll do for the assignments, you'll see that there's groups of patterns that work together. So we'll see, for example, that um, iterator gets used with visitor. And we might think of those things as a sequence, especially when combined with a couple other patterns. And so the end result of the programming assignment you're going to put together here in the class will be a group of patterns from the Gang of Four book that you apply to solve a bigger problem or a bigger set of problems than just one individual thing at a time. So by the time you're done, for example, you're going to be applying bridge, you'll be applying adapter, you'll be applying iterator, you'll be applying strategy, you'll be applying visitor, all these patterns kind of come together, and that's called a pattern sequence. It's a group of patterns that often get applied in a linear order to solve a larger design problem. And so you get a chance to, to play around with that a little bit later. And then the last type of pattern element we're going to just mention briefly is pattern languages. Pattern languages allow you to group together different groups of pattern sequences in order to be able to give design alternatives that you might choose under different circumstances. And what's so really interesting about this stuff is it's, um, it's much like everyday life. Everyday life, you speak prose all day long without really even understanding that you're doing it. You're, you're in, implicitly conjugating verbs. You're doing singular plural matching. You're using you know, indirect references and direct objects and subject verb agreement. All that kind of stuff is what you're doing, right? But you never really stop to think about it. You don't walk around in your head explicitly trying to run through a sentence diagramming uh, you know, lattice, trying to figure out how to speak correctly. You just do it as second nature. Same thing is true with good designers. They don't necessarily sit there and think to themselves, I'm going to write some software, so I must bring out all these patterns and follow them you know, sort of rotely. Instead, it's part of their intuition. It's what they do as developers. It's not what they learn from the school of hard knocks. So these more sophisticated forms of pattern relationships are really just trying to sit down, much like you would do if you wanted to diagram your sentences and write them out and then diagram them so that you could teach somebody else who maybe wasn't such an expert at speaking the language fluently what was correct about speaking English or German or French or Spanish or, or pick your favorite language. So that's what we're doing with these pattern relationships. Good developers know this stuff intuitively. How do you convey that to others? How do you get it out of their heads or out of the source code, as we talked about before? You do it by describing the patterns and their relationships. And then you teach people through example how that stuff works. And we're going to look at lots of examples, but we're not going to get into pattern relationships in, in any detail. We are mostly focusing in this class on patterns in the context of software, and more specifically, software design and implementation, because that's what CS251 is about. It's intermediate software design. It's not software 101. It's not software engineering. It's that middle point between the two. So not surprisingly, the patterns we talk about are primarily patterns of detailed design and code. But there are patterns for lots and lots of other stuff. There's patterns for analysis. There's patterns for requirement specification. There's patterns for testing. There's patterns for integration. There's patterns for a heck of a lot more stuff than we'll ever have a chance to cover in this class, dealing with concurrency and distribution and all these other kinds of things. And so you have to be aware that this is a big, broad world out there. And uh, not everybody has to understand all the pieces all the time. OK, so that basically is the end of, is that the end of that one? Might be the end of that one. Uh, let's see. OK, any questions about, about any of those things? Whoops. Ah, now I know what's going on. Let me uh, want to hide these slides for a second. All right, there we go. Now we're back in business. So as you can see, we have a few more slides in the intro, and then we're going to go ahead and move on, and uh, we'll talk about some other topics. <coughs>
So what I'm going to do now is talk about how you do patterns. Yeah, go ahead. Or general functions. Yeah, yeah so the, 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 here's a good pithy definition of a pattern. A good pithy definition of a pattern is a solution to a problem that arises in a particular context. So adapter, you know, the ones we talk about, adapter, observer, iterator, right? They're problems you run across. You've got things that already exist. How do you make them work together? You, that's a problem. You apply the adapter pattern. That's the solution. And then the adapter pattern has a set of roles and relationships, a structure and a dynamics to it that illustrate how it works. And it, you use that in a particular context. You don't necessarily use it everywhere. Uh, for example, if you could start over from scratch, you might not use the adapter pattern. You make everything work together from the beginning. But if you're in a context where you can't change what's there, you adapt, right? So that's an example. So you can think of patterns as a way of codifying best practices of design and being able to show that there's multiple, at least three known uses. It's not just some whimsical thing you came up with on your own. And so we give names to those kinds of things. So we're going to talk about a process for, for doing all this stuff. So to be successful, and maybe this is sort of at the heart of what you were just asking, um, if you're going to be a successful developer, especially someone with patterns, you, somebody, maybe you, maybe not you, but somebody had to understand the domain in order to figure out what best practices there were in the first place, which is why patterns are really about distilling from experience. It's very hard as a novice to come up with great patterns. Just as it's very hard as a novice, unless you're like Mozart or something, to start writing symphonies with no practice. Uh, you, you have to typically you know, apprentice yourself at the, in, a, in a guild or learn from another master, right? All the examples of karate and Latin dancing and all that kind of stuff. You've got to learn from somebody else who's done it before. So you need to have knowledge of the domain. I, I've often found what's interesting, of course, is what's a domain and, and trying to think about this in a flexible way. When I first started learning patterns, which was 1992 time frame, 93 time frame, I was um, doing a couple things. I was working on my PhD, and I was consulting for a company that was developing the Iridium satellite constellation system. Iridium is a low Earth orbit satellite system that has 66 or so satellites that give you very expensive but ubiquitous phone service anywhere in the world. Uh, and so I was working on this back in the early days. And they were using some middleware technology called CORBA in order to make it easier to write distributed systems at that point. At the same time, I was a reviewer for the Gang of Four book. If you look at the Gang of Four book, you'll see I'm thanked at the beginning as one of the reviewers. What was fun was I was reading this book and I was learning these patterns. I'd never been exposed to these patterns by these names before. I knew some of the patterns from my experience. I didn't know what they were called, but you know, so I was reading the book. And then I was going to work at my consulting job and I was looking at all this code that was implemented using CORBA. And what was interesting was the book had not been published. And the book, if you look at it from a very narrow, limited view, seems to be mostly about user interface stuff, because that's the examples that they give you. But I was reading stuff that was all about networked middleware, distributed computing, and so on. And yet, many, many of the patterns in the Gang of Four book were showing up in this code I was looking at that was written with CORBA. It's like, how did that happen, right? Because obviously they didn't read the book. It hadn't been published yet, and they weren't reviewing it either. Well, what happened was that, and, and they weren't even in the user interface domain, right? So how did this happen? Well, what the truth of the matter is that good developers who have experience tend to come up with common solutions to these recurring problems in a wide range of contexts. Sometimes it's a very narrow context. Sometimes it's a, a broader context. But what was fascinating was all these patterns in the Gang of Four book were showing up in the, the CORBA distributed computing code. And over the years, I, I documented a lot more patterns and wrote other books that went in more detail about some of these things having to do with concurrency. Um, there's a nice history of patterns you can take a look at here, which gives you sort of a, a bird's eye view of 20 plus years of people thinking about this stuff. Patterns really got their, their start from a, a uh, theoretical or conceptual foundation with a, a PhD thesis written by a guy named Eric Gamma who was at the University of Zurich doing his PhD on user interface systems. Surprise, surprise, lots of user interface stuff. <coughs> and he joined forces with three other guys, the, the gang of four, who themselves were also largely working on user interface systems in C++ or Smalltalk or other languages. And they wrote a paper. And then from that paper, they wrote a book. And there were other people who were doing other kinds of things with C++ or other languages in a more narrowly focused way. There was some good Smalltalk work working on it at the same time. 
And around 1994, when the Gang of Four book got published, then it hit the mainstream. Everybody else started to learn. And that's why when you look at the Java code, most of the people who were doing the development of Java in the early days also were learned software experts who were very well aware of the Gang of Four book. So when they started doing the Java libraries and the Java frameworks, they used those patterns all over the place. You look at the Java and it, it's just galore, right? There's observers, there's iterators, all kinds of stuff that's sort of Gang of Four-like patterns are strewn all throughout um, the Java implementation <laughs> and later languages and tools too. And then after 1994, you know, the floodgates opened. Lots of other people were doing cool stuff with patterns, writing books, covering many, many broader topic areas. So nowadays, almost everything you can think of has a book of patterns on it. Some good, some not as good. But the point is that the space is very wide and, and, it, and powerful. Another thing that you need to be able to do is use patterns to evaluate trade-offs in your design. This is one of the other things that separates out the expert from the novice. So the expert oftentimes um, has done it before. In fact, they've probably done it wrong before. So when they're confronted with a problem, they will stop and think, you know, last time I dealt with this issue, last time I had a pool of threads and I was trying to delete an object that could be accessed from multiple threads, how did I do that, right? And so they won't just start from first principles. Instead, they'll, they'll build upon their, their wealth of knowledge. Where did they get that knowledge? Well, sometimes they got the knowledge from the school of hard knocks. They did it wrong, so then they can learn to do it better. A better way to do it, because it's always better to learn from someone else's mistakes than your own mistakes, is to, uh, is to take patterns that have been documented and learn them. And then as you start writing code, look for opportunities to apply them in ways that match with the pattern descriptions. So you find the, whether you have similar problems, you find whether you have similar context, you find whether the solution might work for you and your requirements and so on. And it turns out that there's often alternative ways to build software. And so the, the experts help you to do that. Now, once again, this is something that's very difficult to do in isolation. Uh, if somebody you know, locked you in a room and said, write good software, you'd, you'd have to write an awful lot of bad software to get to the point where you wrote good software. And in fact, you might never learn how to do it well, because if you're just writing it for yourself, you might be able to understand what's going on, but nobody else can, right? Uh, because they, they lack some fundamental insight that you may have. So what you want instead, of course, is to have other people mentoring you, especially when you start out. Say, this is a good way to do it. Here's a bad way to do it. Looking at some stuff I did back in the early days when I first started writing software, I was doing open source code. I mentioned this before. I wrote a lot of code where I ended up hard coding things. I hard coded myself using hard-coded algorithms, hard-coded data structures, hard-coded languages that were generated. So when I wanted to make changes to make my program work more effectively for new requirements that I had not initially anticipated, I had a lot of work on my hands. Not a good situation. You, you want to make changes be easy as opposed to hard because then you can do more stuff with your, with your work. Yes? What does hard-coded mean? Hard-coded. It means that given a choice between different ways of doing things, you chose a way that was only one way to do it. So here's an example. Um, in fact, you have an example right now. Remember when we talked about, going way back in the beginning of the class, we talked about the stack. Remember the, the very first stack we looked at? We looked at this horrible implementation of a stack that defined a fixed size array of ints, and it used plus plus and minus minus to move around that array. That was hard coded. The implementation was hard coded into the software. There was no way you were changing that without changing that code. Conversely, now that we're you know, months down the road here, weeks down the road, now how are we doing our data structures, right? We're defining interfaces that are, that are nicely abstracted. And we're implementing things in such a way where we can have a common interface, like our queue with virtual methods. And then we can use patterns, like the adapter pattern, to plug in an array implementation, a linked list implementation, an STL implementation. So now we haven't hard-coded stuff anywhere near as much. We've, we've made it more open-ended, more flexible, more extensible. So the contrast the original stuff where it was very hard-coded, everything was done in a very um, narrow, implementation-centric way, so any changes required a lot of work, to now where, oh, we want to be able to adapt an existing queue in our model. Oh, that's easy. Just write an adapter. Boom, you're done. You know, so it takes five minutes to do it. You rerun the regression test, you're done, as opposed to spending weeks or months trying to redo it all. That's an example of hard-coding. So I'd hard-coded a lot of stuff. And um, some of the things that patterns allow you to do is they let you make choices between how to get yourself out of these 
overly premature commitments to things. So for example, oftentimes when you're designing software, you might want to be able to have multiple ways of doing something. So for example, with my, my perfect hash function generator program, I might want to have made it, I might want to, to have made it possible to have a language that's generated from the generator be C++ or C or Ada or Pascal or Objective C or C Sharp or Java or whatever. The way I did it, I hard coded it. It was just a gigantic set of if statements that were very hard to work with. A better way would have been to say, let's, let's abstract. Let's use a pattern. Let's use a pattern like strategy. Let's use a pattern like template method, which are two <coughs> patterns we're going to cover quite a bit later. Those patterns both make it possible to defer design and implementation choices till later in the design cycle, later down in the life cycle. But they do it in slightly different ways. The template method pattern relies a lot on inheritance to do this. The, the model that uses strategy does more object composition, not unlike the discussion we had earlier about the difference between the class form of the adapter pattern and the object form of the adapter pattern. So knowing when to make choices between different design alternatives is extremely useful when guided by patterns because then you can think about it at a higher level, not get wrapped up in the implementation details, and yet have a perfectly precise conversation with your colleagues about the trade-offs and the pros and cons of alternative design choices. And let me tell you, when you get further along, that ability to convince your peers of the, the genius of your approach through the appeal to patterns is very, very compelling. Because chances are they won't have heard of them. They won't be able to defend themselves, right? It's, it's <laughs> like, um, you know, infectious diseases that no one has built up immunity for. It makes you very powerful for a while. There was actually a book called Guns, Germs, and, Ski uh, and Steel that talks all about this very trend. So patterns give you a broader arsenal of ways to explain and articulate your design choices. Um, another thing that it's important to understand is that many implementation choices depend on the context in which they're applied. So let me give you a, a concrete example. And this, this gives a, a long history of interesting discussions that took place over decades in about five to 10 minutes. So if you take a look at the Gang of Four book, um, you'll see different interesting things, right? They have the observer pattern. And then they have the observer pattern for, you know, but then you could have the observer pattern for Android, which would be different from the observer pattern that was in the Gang of Four book. And it turns out if you look at the observer pattern in Android, you'll find a couple different variants of that. Here's one where you have something that is going to wait until data changes, and then observers of that data get modified and updated. Here's another one that uses sort of an event communication model called broadcast receivers to let multiple parties know that something in the system has changed, like the battery voltage has gotten low. And there may be various broadcast receivers that want to know that. Those are both examples of the observer pattern, but they differ in key ways, and they have different interfaces, they have different methods, they have different use cases and contexts in which they're applicable. Let's take another example that's maybe a little bit easier to understand. This is ex an example from the Gang of Four book, so you'll get a chance to learn about it uh, directly over time. So it turns out in the Gang of Four, Four book, there's a pattern called the Singleton pattern. And it's documented in the, in the book, and, and it does a very, very simple thing. Um, what you can see here is that the Singleton pattern, which you'll actually get a chance to implement at various points in the class, you put the constructor to be protected or private, and all access to the object is mediated through a static instance method that returns a pointer to the one and only instance of the object. And it does it in a lazy creation way where the first time in, you check to see if the instance has been initialized. And if, if it hasn't, you initialize it. And then you return the result. Of course, after the first time in, it should always be initialized. So you're done. So the Gang of Four book has this pattern. It's, it's, probably, it's arguably the simplest pattern in the world because it's about an if statement and a few other <coughs> subtle details. But it looks really simple at first glance. OK, great. That's, that's our easiest pattern. So people started to apply the pattern, and all was good for a while. But then they began to notice some problems. One of the problems is, how do you get rid of this darn thing? Right? So John Vlasides, one of the Gang of Four members, wrote a book called, or wrote a paper called To Kill a Singleton, where he talked about some of the ways you could get rid of, sing of the um, you could get rid of singletons. Then a later problem happened as people started to try to use singleton in a concurrent environment where you have multiple threads of control running at the same time. In fact, I ran into this problem about 20 years ago when I went to Washington University as a professor. And I was using singleton, and uh, I was noticing that my program wasn't working correctly on a 20 CPU multiprocessor. 
And I started poking around and seeing what's going on. And here were some of the problems. So the classic way of implementing singleton, which is, works like this, you come into the static instance. You check to see if the static data is null. If it is, you make a new one. And in, in any event, you return the reference or pointer to the one that you've either created right now or had created before. That's the classic way of doing things. Unfortunately, it has insufficient synchronization in a multi-threaded environment. So how do you fix this problem? Well, if you're a Java programmer, and, and I apologize a little bit. This is a little bit more advanced Java than you may have gotten, but it's really easy to understand. In Java, there's something called a synchronized block. You can have synchronized methods, and you can have synchronized blocks. All these things mean is only one thread at a time can be executing inside of this block of code or this method. That's what synchronized means. It means serialization. Um, a classic example is, is the protocol used to access the airplane restroom, right? which is vacant and locked. Right? So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a protocol where, where one entity is supposed to be in there at a time. Yeah. Uh, it's a singleton. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Is 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 uh, synchronization a singleton? Critical a critical section can be thought of a, a write a write block synchronization uh, critical section could be thought of as a singleton where only one thread of control can be in there. That's more of a dynamic singleton as opposed to a structural singleton. But the, the same concept is very similar. So you could put a synchronized block. But the problem is that this is actually going to be too much synchronization because now we block things all the time which means that no matter what, we're always grabbing a lock, even though only the first time in, we need to grab the lock. So now things will be too slow. So the right thing to do, and there's all kinds of variants, which I won't go into detail on right now because it's beyond the scope of the class, but it's absolutely fascinating to watch this whole discussion unfold, is to use the volatile type qualifier, which is a way in Java, past a certain point, of being able to say, this particular piece of, of uh, data has got to have the semantics where it, once it's set, it has to have its value propagated to all of the threads atomically so that other threads will get a consistent view of the value after it's been written to. So what happens here is when you do this, you can then go ahead and synchronize just a piece of the whole thing, not the whole thing. So you, you, you go ahead and you, if the guy has not yet been initialized, then you synchronize, but only then. So it's, it's a little bit less overhead. Now, this requires a special, you know, later versions of Java in order to work right. What's interesting about this, if you want to learn the, the history of this, take a look at this link, double check locking. That was a pattern that I wrote in 1995 or 96 or so on that described the pattern oriented solution to this problem of trying to lock singletons. And that paper generated a tremendous amount of interest because people discovered that Java didn't work quite right and the Java memory model didn't work quite right in order to support the double check locking pattern that I had documented. So they spent a lot of time thinking this through and they finally came up with a set of extensions to, to double check uh, or to, to Java and their memory model to support double check locking. And that's now been built into later versions of the language. But what's interesting about this is the following. When the Gang of Four wrote their book, they were not accustomed, they didn't have any experience or not much experience with multi-threaded code which isn't surprising. There wasn't much threading going on when they were doing their work back in the late 80s. So they wrote a, a pattern that didn't account for concurrency. When I was using those patterns in the mid-90s, there was a lot of concurrency at that point. We had multi-CPU machines, we had languages, and we had platforms that supported multi-threading. So I encountered the experience of multi-threading, and though I documented a pattern that solved the gaps in the Gang of Four stuff, which didn't have the knowledge of the context of multi-threading, but I did, so I augmented their stuff to add a bit more. But what the machines I was working on at the time did the ordering of the memory at the, at the memory hierarchy level. So this whole issue of reads and writes passing each other in memory didn't exist. So that wasn't an issue for me. As machines got more sophisticated and they began to allow read and write operations to pass each other in memory to optimize the performance of the hardware, all of a sudden, something that before wasn't important became very important. So people at the virtual machine level, like the Java uh, experts, the Java specification groups and Java expert community, uh, they had to narrow down the virtual machine semantics in order to account for changes in the hardware. So the point of all this stuff is that patterns evolve over time 
as new issues arise and people apply best practices to codify and account for those, those issues. So the final thing in here, so remember the thing is you've got to know the patterns. You have to be able to evaluate trade-offs between different patterns. You have to be able to make implementation and design considerations using patterns. And then finally, you know, once you've done all this design, now it's time to actually do some work. And you have two choices. You either write code from scratch using patterns, or you take code that exists already and integrate your code with it using patterns. Both are great things to do. Different patterns account for different parts of that overall space. And in this class, you'll get experiences with both. In this class, you'll get some experiences writing software from scratch using patterns to guide your work. You'll also get experience in this class taking software that already exists that you wrote a month or two ago, and then using patterns to make it work in new, in new and different ways. So you, it's kind of a little microcosm for the, the full experience you would run into in real life. One of the things that's kind of cool in well-structured software well-structured being my, my definition of well-structured, is you'll often find what's called high pattern density. And this is not just seeing how many random patterns you can glom together just to go hog wild with patterns. It's being able to justify and resolve all the design choices or many design choices you make by showing the patterns whose forces in the problem domain are being resolved by applying those patterns. And you will get to the point when you're done with the, the last piece of the project here where, and you'll probably have you know, 3,000 lines of code, which, by the way, you're going to write in the next couple weeks. Um, you're going to have thousands of lines of code, which actually won't be that hard, because we're going we're to do it in a very incremental way. And almost every single piece of code will have a reason to be there. And you ought to be able to look at the code and go, yeah, I know why that's there. That's there because that was this role from this pattern, and that was this role from that pattern. And so when you're confronted with what would have been a daunting thing at the beginning of the class, where you had to write thousands of lines of code, actually becomes almost paint by numbers when it's all done. Because you're taking this piece of design and this piece of design, you're connecting them together. Every piece has a reason. Everything has a purpose. Now, you can't possibly hope to master that stuff from the sidelines. You've got to get in and look at the code. You've got to read the patterns. You've got to immerse yourself in it. And to the extent that you do that, you'll find your awareness of design in increasing dramatically. If you just wait to the last second and hack up the solution at the last minute, it's not going to work very well, probably won't work at all. And you'll think, man, this pattern stuff is really hard. But that's not because patterns are hard. It's because you're not doing the right set of things. It's like somebody who um, you know, wants to, to win in uh, some you know, first violin contest for the orchestra, or pick your favorite example, Battle of the Bands contest, or you know, uh, wants to get to the next degree of their, their black belt uh, karate. If you don't practice and you show up, and you play against people who practiced, they're going to beat you, right? Because they set, spent the time and, and learned the fundamentals. All right, so to wrap up, patterns give you this variation-oriented design process where you figure out what changes, you figure out what patterns can help to rationalize the design, you tra do trade-off analysis, and you repeat until you're done and you've solved the problem, uh, you give up, or the money runs out. You know, one of those things happens. Going back to what we talked about before, <laughs> It's useful to seek generality, but don't look at the world through pattern-colored glasses. Right? <laughs> this, this is fun with Photoshop, right? <laughs> and uh, so you don't want to be in a situation where everything you do is patterns. That, that's missing the point. There's lots of things in life that are algorithms. There are lots of things in life that are designs. There are lots of things in life that are good designs that maybe don't have enough uniformity and, and uh, pedigree to be considered a pattern. That doesn't mean they're not important. It just means that you have to know what you're doing at any given point in time. So one of the things that's important there, I think that's the last slide here, is follow the rule of three, you know, kind of like a Boy Scout. Um, look for the things that recur. Look for the things that recur in your code. Study other code, not your colleagues' code in the class, but study other code that's available for you on the web to learn about stuff uh, in order to become better as a software developer. Um, I just had a question with the quiz on Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah, so the quiz will cover um, the last two, I mean, today's lecture and the last lecture, which I think are, are all the pattern stuff. And uh, the video should be up online. The reason I switched over to my Mac is it, it takes me like, I don't know, 10 minutes to render the stuff, whereas before it was taking two hours on my PC because the video processing is so much more powerful. So hopefully I'll get that up real soon, maybe by uh, the time I get driving home tonight. Okay, if you have any questions about the assignment, feel free to post them to Piazza.